Okay, so good afternoon students. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday webinar, apparently the last one of the year um, on um, chemical and biomolecular engineering. So my name is John Kavner. I'm from the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And with me today are Professor Fariba Dagani, Dr. E. Shen, and Caroline Tan, one of our um, fourth year students. Um, I assume most of you on today's webinar are from Sydney or the state of New South Wales. Um, if you've been to the University of Sydney, you'll know sort of roughly where the site is. If you haven't, we're near Redfern Station, Central Station and Glebe and Newtown at this end. Um, the, the engineering precinct is down in this area here. We have a, a new building which is currently being completed, the top few floors for um, chemical and biomolecular engineering and biomedical engineering. We have a new laboratory, which we're having a lot of fun buying equipment for and fitting out. And you'll see that um, from next year onwards, a lot of the, a lot more equipment will be arriving over the summer. Um, now, for those of you on the call, um, one of the questions that comes up a lot is what is chemical engineering? Now, there's a global group called the Institution of Chemical Engineers or ICHEME for short, and this is how they define it. So modern society relies on the work of chemical, biochemical and process engineers. Um, manage resources, protect the environment, and so on. Okay, chemical engineering is about changing raw materials into useful products that you use every day in a safe and cost-effective way. And I can give some examples here: of petrol, plastics, fibers, and so on. Um, chemical engineers are also called the universal engineer. Okay, so we have to understand processes at multiple scales. So, in some of our work, we think of about what's happening at the atomic scale in other examples at the micro scale at the size of processing equipment which could be several meters or tens of meters tall processing plants which could be the size of your school as well as um, entire industries and global economies if we look at some big achievements in chemical and biomolecular engineering um, one of the big ones is the scale up of antibiotics and making them cost um, affordable in water treatment and wastewater treatment, the production of vaccines, which have obviously been in the news a lot in the last year or two, um, improvements in battery technologies. I suspect many of you are watching this on a laptop computer. It's probably a lithium ion battery. There's a, um, a little sort of infographic here or graphical abstract from some of the researchers in our school who are looking at something called a zinc air battery, which is flexible. So conceivably, this snowman could wear a um, wear a battery um, as a scarf and actually be able to recharge their phone. Um, and materials like this um, biomaterial here, tetraherix, um, are the people who make it. And Professor Degani will talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, a lot of you are in year 10, 11, 12 at school. So you'll be thinking about sort of careers afterwards. Um, the graduate salary for chemical engineers is in the order of 70 to 90,000 per year in the first year out. And our graduates go to lots of different and interesting places. Okay. Some of these brand names you would recognize. Okay. We have several graduates at Lint Chocolate. We have graduates at Sydney Water. We have graduates at Johnson and Johnson, both locally and internationally. Uh, we have graduates in companies like AB Maori who make the baker's yeast that would have gone into the bread you ate for toast this morning. We have graduates at water companies like Stantec, WSP. We have um, quite a few graduates at gas companies like BOC. We have graduates who go into mining. We have we still have graduates who go into oil and gas, but primarily they're overseas. Um, we have graduates who go into finance and consulting in banks, insurers, and so on with companies like Ernst & Young, Commonwealth Bank, and so on. About 10% of our graduates go into further study, generally PhDs, and a few of them go on to medicine and other areas. So lots of different areas where they can apply their chemical engineering knowledge. Um, at the moment, it's a particularly good time for graduates. They're, they're all finding very good jobs and companies are actually almost fighting over um, third and fourth year students for summer work. Okay, And there's even second year students getting um, good summer employment. Dr. Yi, do you want to talk a bit about the DECRA fellowship you've just been awarded? Yes, of course. Thanks, John. So I was really uh, uh, glad that I, I was awarded this uh, fellowship and that will allow me to do some like uh, research on the uh, protein 
focused area. So why protein is so important? Because you might already know what is protein, right? You can find it everywhere, especially like in food or in cells. And here I'm going to talk about something related to health and also related to uh, sustainable uh, manufacturing. So protein has a lot of uh, level of structures and that makes them very interactive. So protein can interact with a lot of different biomolecules also with themselves. Okay, so if they interact a lot with themselves in cells can cause some big problems because uh, diseases such, such as Alzheimer or Parkinson is actually caused due to the aggregation of the protein. However, I mean, this has been discovered a really long time ago, but recently people discovered that the protein can also undergo liquid phase separation, forming this uh, spherical uh, droplet-like condensating cells, as you can see in this movie. This fluorescent label, the spherical shape in the cells, these are the condensates, protein condensates, very, very rich in protein molecules, and they exist in your cells. They are very dynamic. They can appear, they, are, they can disappear, carrying out very important biological functions in cells. However, when these kind of molecules become not very dynamic, get arrested, right, and start to form some solids or aggregates, that can lead to the diseases I was talking about before. So if I can go to the next slide, please. So for my DECRA fellowship, I mean, it's kind of a research-focused uh, uh, fellowship. What I would do is to look at the protein phase transition from monomers, so disperse the protein molecules in the solution to this condensate, very rich in pro protein molecules in this droplet, and to the solid, like gel or aggregates. And the, the method I'm going to use, including like some optical techniques, so and some microfluidic approach, so I can monitor, mirror, and modulate these protein phase transitions to be able to understand why a healthy cell will, will become sick and why human will get a disease. And for the application part, because protein is a very nice natural polymer, we can also use that to develop some uh, biomaterials such as bioplastics, because it has extremely good mechanical um, and other kind of properties. So by using proteins, right, you can have a certain process, you can add other kind of uh, compounds together, then you can form this kind of uh, either a film or a fiber or some like uh, micro gels, which made by proteins, and you can use them to replace the synthetic polymer plastics that will be great for our sustainability for environment and also can help us to um, tackle this net zero emission challenge because you know all the synthetic polymer uh, plastics actually from the fossil fuel and it's not really good for our environment. Um, so that is a kind of um, uh, my DECRA fellowship in a nutshell. And um, it, this is also kind of reflecting uh, what kind of uh, uh, chemical engineering we are doing in our school. It's not only the you know catalysis or water treatment, but also something fundamental on biomolecules like the protein and it can be disease related, can have uh, biomedical applications and also have uh, um, biomaterial development applications. Yeah, Thanks, again, yeah that's about it. Fariba, do you want to talk a little about your um, heart valve project? Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. As John said, one of the major things that you learn when you do the chemical engineering, you, lo you learn how to problem solve. And you can use your skill in different areas and you, you will be amazed what you can do. And one of the problems that we were, uh, you know, someone approached us, a clinician approached us was the problem that they have with the congenital heart disease and these children, really need to do operation, but there is nothing available for them to have a permanent solution and uh, to replace their heart valve, which is uh, damaged or need replacement. And what we did in as a chemical engineering to solve the problem, we will thinking about how we can take image of the heart valve, how we can uh, look at the heart valve structure and design using computational modeling that you can see in here the video to make a better structure of the heart uh, you know, valvular conduit for these uh, children. And then we also work on the material, as you can see in here, we can 
design the material that can mimic the properties of the heart valve. Basically, it can be elastic. You know, if you will be amazed to look at the heart valve, how complex it is and how it can operate when it is very thin film, actually. But we were able to design a material that can have similar properties of the heart valve tissue and uh, leaflet tissues. And we were using this uh, knowledge and skills in the chemical engineering to actually design equipment that can actually help us to look at the performance of this heart valve that we design uh, in the you know, simulated body condition. And you can see that this heart valve that we designed can actually open and close like what you have seen uh, this equipment called pulse duplicator and we can see how it performs. And we are hoping that in future we can use this new design of next generation of the polymeric heart valve for the treatment of these children, which usually have to do many, many operations during their life. And it has a very high risk of morbidity and hopefully they can survive and they don't need to do many operations. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> yep, I think so. Uh, Fariba, we spoke earlier, I, sh I showed earlier that, that picture of the tetraherix yes, um, polymer. Do you want to talk a bit about that here? Sure. Yes, I mean, um, you know that when you do operation, usually we have to go to hospital, stay in the hospital for many, many months, perhaps sometimes to recover. Uh, our idea was, you know, it happens when uh, one of my friends break his hand, her hand, and she has to do the major operation and make implant, which was metal, was not really similar to the body tissues. And we were thinking, is there a possibility that we can design a material that you don't need to do the big operation, it can be used for non-invasive operation? And if we wanted to use material that fits our body, will be similar to our body, it should be something like protein that we have in our you know, structure of the body, collagen type or plastic type material that we have. But the problem is this type of material doesn't have good mechanical strength. We can use synthetic polymer that are used for plastic that you use now for <clears throat> making plastic bag or other things, but they don't have good properties that can be accepted by our body that can be considered as a foreign body and will be rejected. As a chemical engineer, we were thinking, how we can use actually a material and design a material which can have both this property, good mechanical property, good biocompatibility, and it can be used by injection and we don't need to do operation for a small injury that we have, for example, for dental operation or for some other operation. Now, we, this material that we design is biocompatible, similar to the protein, has biological activity, has good mechanical property, and we can tune its mechanical property that it can be used for a skin, for bone, and for many other tissues. And we don't, we, and what happens, it is liquid in the room temperature, as you can see in the next slide. <clears throat> it is liquid, you can put it in the syringe, inject it, and it can make a gel in the body temperature. And we can use this material for, as, I, as you can see in here, for dental operation, for even delivery of the vaccine uh, through the no, no, nasal delivery, for oral delivery, and it can be easily designed, it can be used for, and the good thing about this material, it is adhesive, it can attach to the body tissue, and you don't need to do any suturing, which make healing very fast. And you can see that the chemical engineer skills that you learn, it can actually make you uh, solving many, many problems that can be related to the health and environment. And you know, the future, if you work in this area, you can actually have your own startup company. That is the outcome of the research that one of our students has done. And now he has his own company and producing this material for many, many different applications. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, 
Um, could you tell the people online a bit about your um, MIPS experience? So MIPS is a program where a quarter to a third of our final year students spend a semester in industry doing a thesis. So Carolyn? Yep. So hi everyone. Um, yep, so for the first six months of my fourth year, I was placed at VOC. So it's an industrial gas company where I was working on a project known as nitrous oxide emissions, minimization and management. So I think not many may know, but nitrous oxide is actually a greenhouse gas as well. But, and it's 300 times worse than carbon dioxide, which often which often people would know carbon dioxide as a very big uh, greenhouse gas. So this was this project was an essential focus for BOC, especially with you know current global focus on you know environmental social governance as well as the net zero goals that I think Dr. Yi would mention earlier as well. So there was a clear driving force behind understanding, you know, emission sources, where are all of these emissions coming from, and also developing long-term sustainable solutions. So this project was done in a couple of steps where I came to start off, off with like, you know, finding the root of the emissions problem in their nitrous oxide plan, where they produce it, as well as then looking to strategies that could aid with minimizing the nitrous oxide plan. Then the next step was to test like viability of the strategy through like high simulation, which is more like a process design that we can, you know, test equipments out or like see whether how well that would help to reduce emission losses. And that would also look into like, you know, financial aspects because that would be, you know, a quite a sum of capital expenditure that would be involved with, you know, installing a new equipment, for example, to help with it. So overall, the project was a very challenging one in terms of, you know, finding really going deep diving into the project and seeing, you know, the plan in a full scale compared to, you know, what we learn in, in the degree where we learn, you know, in like a normal um, smaller scale system, but this was more in the larger scale. And you can really see how, I guess, why and how important, I guess, all these guesses that actually helps, you know, different applications in different industries as well, you can see it. So I would say that, but it was very rewarding in the sense of, you know, the learning curve that you learn, as well as gaining invaluable industry experience and, you know, preparing you ahead of the real working life. So that's a quite a good step I guess but after you know learning learning the uh, foundation in uni and then moving on to the next step of you know the industry experience before you head into the real world so you said has done a really great job in seeing that through thanks Carolyn um for Eva while, while we're talking about jobs and the real the sort of world after university um do you want to talk a bit about um buds and and their their growth and so sure. on Yes, I mean, about a couple of years ago, uh, before COVID happens, uh, one of the, you know, startup company uh, joined our university, I mean, contacted us and they wanted to have a new type of product. You know, as you know, production of the meat cannot be sustainable in future. Population is growing and because the land is limited, we cannot rely uh, for protein source uh, from the animal or livestock only, we need to think about alternative protein source. And this is the ambition of the company to produce a very superior product, uh, alternative protein product. And, you know, you can use pulses, you know, legumes and other sources of the protein, but even you are vegetarian, you know, the number of people who are vegetarian is only 20%. And people like to see meat as a alternative as a major sources of the food. And the company has uh, this idea to make a food from the plant which can taste and texture similar to the food that people enjoy, like you know, uh, many type of you know, burgers, sausages, and many other type of protein made from the animal. And we worked with this company and we were able to use the plant, uh, you know, protein and texturize it and producing the food, which is now in the market. Uh, but you can have these products, uh, burgers that you, which taste is much very, very similar and the texture is very similar to the uh, texture of the meat. You can't make a difference between them if nobody tell you this is not meat. 
and uh, the, the, as a chemical engineer, we have the technology to uh, design and convert this raw product pulse to this final product. This is what, you know, as I said, the problem solving, using our skills uh, of chemical engineering to convert the raw material to the final product, which can be produced in larger scale. Now this company started from zero product within two years. Now they have more than 60 employees and they could in, uh, have uh, investment, you know, uh, some funding received from different sources, more than 60, more than $100 million funding to uh, bring this product to the market. It is in many supermarkets in Australia and they are going to export it to Asia Pacific very soon. Thanks. And um, uh, th there's also quite a few job opportunities um, in other sort of chemical engineering industries. So um, there's a lot of attention at the moment on mRNA and there's about $100 million being spent in Victoria on an mRNA factory. In Sydney at AstraZeneca, they're um, spending about $200 million or $100 million extra investment there. And there's quite a few jobs. So there's a lot of jobs in the chemical engineering industry in um, in these new areas like food and bio, but also in other areas, sort of um, process engineering, water. I went on to Indeed yesterday as a check and there were 37 chemical engineering jobs in Sydney. Um, which is quite a lot for December because most most people have finished hiring by now. Um, Carolyn, do you want to talk a bit about the benefits of MIPS for your long term career? So, you, you nearly finished your time at university. So, what what's coming next? Mm. So, I'd say after university, would definitely be you know looking forward to it. It's like you know working at an industry and as like a, a process engineer. So in particular, I think from MIPS, from my experience in MIPS that I was working in a gas company that really opened up my eyes into seeing how big the gas industry is in general and how, you know, you use gas in so many different aspects, even like, you know, just a packet of chips that you have at home that would need gas inside to fill up the air in the in a packet of chips. So it's it's actually very, I guess in some sense very relate, relatable in different aspects of our life. So I'd say um, with MIPS, you know, I think it definitely provided me a guidance of what's next after my degree and how I'm able to then use my degree effectively as well as an as a chemical engineer. And I think I would say like the gas industry has very broad opportunities that's coming up especially as a new one in terms of like clean hydrogen for example as you know it's coming up very prominently and very big in that sense so I would say with you know the degree in UCIT and then moving forward to working that gives you that good transition as well and you know it brings you leads you towards like a step-by-step -step procedure before you know you enter the real world so I think that's a good definitely a good and invaluable like experience for that for that and onwards thanks on. Carolyn um yeah, um, you you were at Cambridge before. Why, why did you choose to come to Sydney? Yes, <laughs> thanks, John. So yeah, I, I mean, I have been in a lot of countries. So before Cambridge in the UK, I was in Switzerland. Before Switzerland, I was in the US. So I have seen like uh, quite many places. And uh, I have to say, I choose uh, oh. University of Sydney First of all, because the country is great. I really like uh, Australia. It's in a very great place with great nature, great weather, maybe not this year. And uh, then I think there's also huge potential in the field of uh, biochemical engineering. And I think that is a kind of a gap, actually. Uh, Australia is going to develop very soon in maybe next five to 10 years. So like John was saying before, there are a lot of job opportunities on like uh, biotech or like uh, uh, biochemical engineering, such as for the vaccine production or for, like Fariba said, advanced uh, food processing. And I think, uh, indeed, especially after COVID-19, that we can see that if a country like relying on the, the products of, uh, from import is not very sustainable. So, so I think the government realized that as well. That's why there's a really a lot of things going on to promote the domestic production for like pharmaceutical uh, products, uh, biomedical um, products, and also like uh, food, advanced food products. That's also why I think uh, University of Sydney and the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering 
is a great place for me to develop my skills, to use my knowledge, and to you know um, educate students. Thank you. Um, for I'm sure some of you are thinking about what you'll study. And we've got quite a good website called cusp, cusp.sydney.edu.au. And you can look through all the degrees. But just as an overview, um, in all of our engineering degrees, you study maths in your first year. For chemical engineering, you study chemistry, some computing. The ones marked in bold are the ones that are taught by the chemical engineering school. Up here in the bottom, sorry, down here in the bottom right corner, there's space for electives where students can specialise. Um, the ones marked in red are the ones I teach at the moment. Um, the specialisations we offer as a school are in food and bioprocessing, in the sort of digital areas of chemical engineering, in process intensification, which is about designing smaller, more efficient processes, and water and environmental treatment. Um, we, we pride ourselves on giving students hard and open-ended questions to try and solve. So some examples of things I've used in my classes. Um, in 2017 and 2018, I asked my class to look into how do you remediate PFAS, the um, firefighting foam and the, the chemical. <clears throat> we came up with a whole lot of methods. None of them were probably ever going to be economic, but we had a good idea what was out there. And it's actually become a research area for me. And I'd like to show you some pictures, but we're thinking of patenting something. So you'll have to wait a little for that. Um, 2019, we asked the students to look at how do we produce battery grade lithium for export. Most people don't realise that Australia is the world's biggest lithium exporter. And it's probably 50-50 whether the lithium in your phone or computer has actually come from Australia. Um, and more recently, we've looked at hydrogen for export. Um, Carolyn mentioned it's a big growing industry or coffee for import replacement. So coffee processing is another potential chemical engineering um, area. And in all of these, we get um, industry experts involved in helping us scope the project, but also giving the students some um, some input during the semester. Okay, and last in the past year, we looked at green steel. So how can you make steel without a carbon dioxide emission? And we had a couple of um, industry experts and we went on the tour of the steel, the, the steel works in Wollongong. Yee, this semester we were looking at cellular agriculture. Do you want to explain what that is to the audience? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, great. So like a farmer was saying before, like farming cows is not really a very sustainable practice, right? And uh, I mean, they also also produce a lot of greenhouse gases, um, you might already know. And this, but some of people also would like to have a juicy burger with the real meat inside. How can we do that? We can actually uh, ferment. So the grow the, the, the meat cells inside a petri dish or even a bioreactor and to produce these meat cells and in the end to compose them into a real meat. So how do so so for this master in this biochemical engineering course, what we learned is that how we can take the cell from the cow, I mean very well select the cow, very well select the cell, and then we can grow this cell into some tissues, grow the tissue into a meat, and in the end we use this meat for uh, advanced food uh, manufacturing. So it's a very, very cool project. Yeah. Thanks, Yi. I think we're getting close to the end of the time we have now. Um, just some happy smiling photos of our students, either on site tours, out in industry, in the lab, whether they're um, working on um, ab abalone for treating viruses, growing algae to make pigments um, and various other things. So um, thanks for attending today um, and our, our invitation to you is to be part of solving the world's greatest challenges. So Carlos, do we have questions in the q and I I don't see any questions, but um, we still have a couple of minutes. The students, if there's any questions from this fantastic session, please put them on the Q&A and we'll be very um, happy to answer them now. Otherwise, thank you very much, John. And um, any last words that you would like to say to <clears throat> our beautiful audience? That, that um, it looks been a pleasure to us? speak to you this afternoon. Um, there, there'll be, there are other events coming up where you can come and ask detailed questions about your, um, you know, study choices and so on. So the university will have an info day on December sixteenth for primarily for people who've just got their HSCs, but there'll be other open days next year. Um, 
we, we generally host students in our school from Engineers Australia summer schools and other activities through the year. So we're happy if you want to approach us and ask questions, whether it's now or later on. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you very much, everyone else who who, um, who took the time to come today. Thank you to the School of um, Chemical Engineering. And um, everyone, have a nice day. Stay safe. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.